Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Cooper Union Forum. This is your chairman, Johnson E. Fairchild, speaking to you from the great hall of the Cooper Union, where we are continuing with our program on the search for mental health. <laughs> For the benefit of our radio audience, for the benefit of our radio audience, uh, this was done deadpan, believe me. Uh, <laughs> our subject for discussion is hallucinogenic drugs or how to use your head. And our speaker is Dr. Timothy Leary, clinical psychologist, who, among other things, just got off an airplane about an hour ago. <laughs> and Personally, I'm so happy that he got off it an hour ago, otherwise I would have had it done. It. In any event, Dr. Leary, who had his origins in New England, believe it or not, <laughs> been educated in Alabama, Washington, and his doctor's degree from the University of California. He has been in clinical psychology, a veterans administration, resident assistant to Kaiser Foundation Hospital in Oakland, California, and he has had uh, numerous lectures and activities. Been at Harvard University, 1959 to 1963. He is present director of the Castalia Foundation. <laughs> Believe it or not, he was at Harvard, <laughs> and director of the Castalia Foundation. He has done a great deal of work in this general field. He is author of Psychedelic Experience, and also 27 essays and articles on psychedelic drugs. And uh, frankly, as director of adult education, I'm very happy to welcome Mr. Timothy Leary to the Cooper Union Forum, speaking on hallucinogenic drugs or how to use your head. Mr. Leary. This lecture on how to use your head could be summed up in one sentence. You have to go out of your mind to use your head. Now, with that, I should go home. But uh, there's a 58-minute radio tape that has to be filled, so I'll go on for a little more time. My aim tonight is to try to present the most important message you've ever heard. Now, this aim, quixotic as it may seem, is to change your view of man and maybe your view of yourself. I know it sounds grandiose, but this aim is not, because it's nothing new. We're going to be talking about the oldest problem, the oldest mystery which man has faced, and what I'm going to say, again, is the oldest message in human history. Now, this lecture could be given in hundreds of metaphorical, literary, philosophic, scientific languages. I'm going to try tonight, though, to uh, present this story in terms of a mystery novel, 
a detective story because I think that uh, it's the greatest scientific, philosophic mystery story in history. And it all has to do with an incredible robbery, the greatest confidence game in history, the greatest loss of treasure that we can conceive of, the most successful cosmic swindle, and the victims, you and I, don't even know we've been robbed, or maybe have only the dimmest suspicion that uh, something has happened to us. Let me describe the incredible nature of the crime. At birth, the human being is presented with an extraordinarily valuable gift, an instrument, magical and intricate and powerful beyond belief, a camera with literally billions of lenses. I'm talking, of course, about the human brain. Neurologists tell us that the brain contains between 10 and 13 billion nerve cells. Now, of course, that's a ridiculous statistic. Uh, the human mind just can't grapple with the concept 10 billion. But to make matters worse, neurologists tell us that any one brain cell can be hooked up with as many as 25,000 other cells. So that what you're dealing with is a matrix, a network, a, a computer, the number of associations of which, uh, again, are stupendous. Uh, we're told that the number of possible associations in the human brain at any one second is larger than the number of atoms in the universe. Neurologists tell us that the human brain fires off about 5,000 million signals a second. There's a tremendous amount of activity going on in the seven inches behind our forehead. There's a tremendous amount of information and a tremendous amount of awareness going on there. Your brain is aware of a thousand, several thousand activities going on in your kidney at every one second. It's aware of what's going on in your liver. It's processing the most incredible kinds of chemical information, pH content, blood levels, sugar levels, oxygen, CO2. Your brain is aware of this uh, enormous amount of information. But we, that is I, Timothy Leary, and each one of you is cut off, of course, from awareness of most of these processes. Now, the gap between what the mind is aware of and the limits of consciousness within our head is the robbery that I mentioned before. Almost every culture and every religion has some way of explaining how we lost this. And most cultures and most religions have some theories as to how to get it back. The Christian theology tells us that we lost it because of the sins of our forefathers. Eastern philosophies tell us that it's there inside and we can get it back and that most of the things we see going on outside are maya or processes that uh, tend to pull us in to uh, external awareness and preventing us from enjoying and understanding this fantastic kaleidoscopic series of activities within. And almost every religion has produced a method for expanding consciousness or for recapturing what we've lost. 
according to the monotheistic religions, the Judeo-Christian and Islamic theories, there's a judge up there that will give it back to us if we follow his book and do what his lawyers tell us to do. <laughs> Eastern religions and Eastern psychologies have, of course, a wide variety of methods for expanding consciousness, for getting back the potentials which we've lost. And even most primitive cultures have developed some sort of myths, heroic uh, sagas, which suggests how man has tried to recover the lost treasure. Now, in taking this eccentric position of taking the brain seriously, you run the risk of getting out of touch with your professional colleagues. <laughs> but there are some comforts because you're admitted to another club, which is one of the oldest scientific and philosophic associations in history, which has been going on for centuries and for thousands of years. The long line of people who have had some suspicion that there's a lot more than we've been led to believe. Now, the present time is a very exciting time for the members of this club because uh, there have been three developments very recently in science which have suggested new metaphors, new ways of explaining this mystery, and new methods for rediscovering the lost treasure. These three developments are first, the uh, recent findings about the genetic code. Second, and more important for us who are alive today, the research on the process of imprinting, which is the way the nervous system is structured early in the life of any species. And third, the development of the psychedelic drugs. I want to talk about the genetic code and its implications for the expansion of consciousness. We're focusing here on the question, um, why did we lose access to all this consciousness which resides within and who did it? And I'm going to suggest for metaphorical purposes that's the genetic code which has so designed the nervous system as to rob man temporarily of access to his own head. Now, of course, the first thing you have to do in cracking a mystery is to put yourself in the place of the criminal. You have to find the motive for the crime. So I'm going to ask you to think with me as to what the genetic code's game is. Now, of course, this has always been a very impious thing to do. When man tries to figure out what God's game is, or when the human mind, which is a fragment of the nervous system, attempts to figure out what the genetic blueprint is up to, because it's the genetic blueprint which designed and produced the brain and the mind that's trying to figure it out. So we're in a ridiculous position, but um, let's try it. Now, from the standpoint of the strategy of the genetic material, every living species is simply a creative solution to a packaging problem. Every single-celled organism, 
every lower form of life, every fish in the sea, every form of vegetation, every mammal, including man, is an original design, a packaging design, to meet the particular environmental problems that that species faces in the air, under the earth, in the water, on land. Now, when you get to the more complicated forms of life, like mammals, the packaging problem is really incredible. Because the mammalian body, or the human body, is an enormously intricate machine to get this simple task done. Now, the genetic code, as I imagine it to operate, faces a very tricky problem here. And here's the problem. In order to get the, um, in order to keep the mammalian body going, you have to have a nervous system which coordinates and registers uh, all the information that's going on inside this incredible machine and outside around us. The brain has to be aware of uh, billions of uh, events which occur from moment to moment. But, the pilot of this seed, this mobile seed carrying package, obviously can't be tuned in on all of this uh, activity. Because if you and I were aware of this kaleidoscope of events inside, we'd be so ecstatic, we'd be so engulfed, we'd be so amazed, we'd be so delighted that we'd simply stand still and never move uh, in wonder and awe and uh, ecstasy and we wouldn't pilot our uh, package through the jungles of uh, New York uh, to uh, keep the genetic codes game going. So you see the strategy. Somehow there has to be a pilot stuck way, way, way up in a crow's nest. thinks he has a very important role in the whole operation, but actually down below there's this uh, enormous uh, ship with this mobile uh, factory moving along, which uh, really uh, pays no attention to um, what's going on in the crow's nest. The reason that the human mind is cut off from most of the brain's activity uh, seems to have logical, strategic meaning to the problem that the genetic code faces. And this, I suggest, is the why of the great neurological robbery. Next, I want to discuss the how of the robbery. <laughs> the way the genetic code solves this problem is through the process of imprinting. And this is the second great discovery of the last 15 years, which we're convinced may well change man's view of himself. Now, the research on, on imprinting has been done by scientists called ethologists. These are men who study animal behavior and animal learning in the very early hours of the organism's uh, history. Um, and they've come up with some remarkably uh, interesting findings in the last few years. The first finding is that very early, in the first hours or the first days of almost every bird and mammal species, there's what's called a critical period. This is a period when the nervous system seems to be sensitive and vulnerable and open to uh, registering certain environmental events and uh, imprinting them. This critical period, which has uh, been fairly well studied for many species, um, ends, and after the critical period, 
the process of imprinting can no longer take place. Now let me give you an example. In the case of uh, most birds, let's take, uh, for example, ducks. The duck, usually the baby duck, usually imprints the first object that moves and make no makes noise. And uh, any object which moves and makes noise during the critical period will then be followed. And all of the instinctual machinery inside the duck's body will then be uh, focused on this first imprinted object. Now, of course, in almost every case, the first moving object that makes noise that the baby duck uh, experiences is the mother. And that's great because uh, the baby duck imprints the adult of its species and then is hooked on the duck game. <laughs> But if you remove the mother duck before the critical period, which uh, I think in the case of ducks last, say, between the 12th and 20th hour of, uh, of uh, the baby's life, if you remove the mother and substitute any other object uh, which moves and makes noise, the duck will imprint that. One of the most amusing and somewhat horrifying studies which have been done by ethologists is uh, that baby ducks were presented during this critical period with a large, round, orange basketball. <laughs> which led to the pathetic picture of the baby ducklings following the basketball as it was pulled or towed around the room. Uh, to uh, test whether imprinting has, take, whether it has taken place, you repeat the imprinting sequence uh, after the critical period. In this case, uh, the du baby duck was put in a Y maze, and the left-hand part of the Y maze was a nice, round, fluffy mother duck, and then the right uh, arm of the Y maze was an orange basketball. The ducks were imprinted on the basketball, took one look at the mother duck, and followed the orange basketball. <laughs> this is both funny and tragic because it raises the question, in the case of the human being, what accidental orange basketballs have you and I been exposed to early in life? <laughs> now, there's one fascinating aspect of, of imprinting which is tremendously relevant to the psychedelic experience, and for that matter, to other interpretations of the psychedelic experience, like the religious. And that is that imprinting has to do with external objects. And the trick of the genetic code in setting up the strategy of imprinting was to get our attention on things out there, and on one particular thing out there. Then, of course, once you imprint something, once you imprinted your orange basketball, then the process of learning which psychologists study took over conditioning so that first there was the orange basketball and then you found that the orange basketball uh, had a bottle and then you uh, knew that every time uh, you heard footsteps on the floor the orange basketball was there with the bottle and slowly step by step through conditioning reinforcement learning so forth uh, you built up the very complicated structure uh, that you now have as a socialized human being um, but uh, the suggestion is that this all started and uh, was based on an original imprinting experience, an, ex uh, an irreversible biochemical process engraved on your nervous system. Now, the, uh, the, the science of imprinting is uh, getting quite complicated, and, and I, I'm always tempted to go into imprinting uh, experiments because they have such tremendous relevance for the human situation. You see, if you keep the baby duck in a, uh, in a uh, dark box during this critical period, uh, after the 20th hour, if you take the box out, the baby duck will just wander around aimlessly and will open up its beak to be fed at any noise. We'll try to copulate it when it gets older with any uh, moving object. Uh, uh, it's helpless in a survival sense. There's some evidence from human beings, although there's been almost no scientific studies in printing, that little babies who have had no human object around during the early hours uh, develop into um, 
It's called childhood schizophrenics. That is, they can never get any contact with a human being. And when human beings try to uh, uh, contact these little babies, uh, it's just like the mother duck attempting to contact uh, that uh, little baby duck that uh, is off following a basketball. A most eerie and disturbing experience to watch. Now, according to the ethologists, imprinting is a biochemical engraving of the nervous system which is irreversible. <clears throat> From the standpoint of the genetic code, the genetic code plays the game of statistics with us. It knows that uh, in most cases we will imprint adults in our species and then if we model ourselves and learn from that imprinted object the chance that we'll grow up to be like our parents who are successful enough from the standpoint of the genetic code that they had us and so the game can keep going. <coughs> but the, uh, the uh, most relevant point to our discussion tonight is that once this imprinting has taken place the nervous system has been frozen. There's that snapshot of the duck and you can be conditioned to relate other things uh, to that orange basketball, but uh, uh, the uh, general feeling is that uh, imprinting is irreversible. Of course, there's one other disturbing thing about imprinting. I'm convinced that if you ask the baby duck, now come on, why is it that you chase that uh, cold uh, plastic basketball when you could uh, chase that nice fluffy mother duck? The duck would probably have 31 good logical rational reasons why. <laughs> you know, after all, orange is a nicer color. And then, uh, there's no... Uh, it's more, uh, it's cleaner. <laughs> you can't get venereal disease. And, uh, keep the birth uh, rate down. At times it seems to us that one of the functions of the mind is to rationalize and protect uh, an accidental early imprint. Another interesting aspect of imprinting is that it can be affected, postponed, delayed, influenced by drugs. For example, reserpine uh, can postpone period of imprinting if uh, baby ducks are kept or baby birds are kept on, um, on reserpine, uh, then long after the time when the critical period is over, uh, imprinting can take place. This, of course, has uh, implications for uh, other drug approaches to this problem. I'm suggesting then that imprinting is the method that the genetic code uses to focus the attention of the pilot of this mobile seed carrying package on certain aspects of the environment which statistically will uh, teach it how to uh, survive. But what this means is that the genetic code has preempted about 99.999% of your brain and my brain for its purposes and has left us with this 0.0001% for us to play out uh, our chessboard on. Aldous Huxley has a very uh, interesting thing to say about that. Uh, he made the comment that uh, he finds it amusing and uh, altogether uh, admirable that 99% of his brain didn't know that Aldous Huxley existed. <laughs> <clears throat> Having suggested the why and the how of this neurological robbery, I want to move next to what we think is the new solution. Now, of course, imprinting is simply a term. It's a metaphor. Uh, what we ask of any metaphor or any theory in science is, first of all, how much of the data or how many different uh, findings, how many different fields does it tie together? Uh, the imprinting metaphor is interesting because it ties together ethology, uh, neurology, uh, pharmacology, and we think uh, psychology. 
The second thing you ask of any metaphor or any a new theory is uh, how practical is it? And uh, as I hope to point out later, we think there are uh, uh, very practical implications of the imprinting theory for uh, man's use of his head. We suggest that psychedelic drugs may be seen as chemical agents which temporarily suspend your old imprint. That is, we think that most of us go through life interpreting and experiencing everything in terms of some very tired old snapshots which were imposed upon us maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. And the job of our mind is to relate every new experience in life to some object or some um, person on that tired old snapshot. So that every new uh, woman you meet is usually seen in terms of uh, a chain of uh, other women back to whatever woman was in your original imprint, if you were lucky to have a woman in it. Now, there are many reasons why we think that it's useful to uh, conceive of the psychedelic drugs as suspenders of imprinting. And one of them has to do with this uh, commitment, attachment of the imprinting uh, process to the external. Because there's one thing that happens during an LSD session is that you tend to lose a lot of your uh, attachment to external events. It's perfectly uh, typical that during an LSD session, the subject will lie for five or six hours, completely silently, not moving around, and perhaps even with their eyes closed, which has led in the past some psychiatrists to say, aha, LSD causes catatonic uh, stupors. <laughs> but then when you ask the person what was going on during that five or six hours when you didn't move, uh, were you in a stupor or a coma, and the person say, coma? More was going on in any one second of that period than uh, uh, in any month of my life before. <laughs> the point is, and this of course is the tricky point, that the commitment to the external orange basketball is temporarily lost, which can be an ecstatic liberation or it can be a terrorizing paranoia, depending upon how much you understand about uh, the possibilities of your mind. Now, there's another interesting line of evidence which uh, kind of focuses in here, and this is the evidence from a line of studies of psychologists uh, in the last few years, which is called sensory deprivation. <laughs> the word sensory deprivation is an amusing one because what psychologists mean by sensory deprivation that word deprivation is a, that was a tricky one, is that if you put a person in a dark room where there's not any noise or any stimulation, and you keep him there for several hours, uh, after this period of time, strange things begin to happen. Uh, he begins to have, have hallucinations. Uh, he begins to develop paranoias. Or he begins having a wonderful time. Um, <laughs> Of course, most of these studies have been done with uh, Air Force pilots or uh, very outgoing Americans. <laughs> and when they're separated from their orange basketball for more than one hour, <laughs> when they're separated from their orange basketball for more than one hour, they begin to bang their heads against the wall. On the other hand, what sensory deprivation is, of course, is one of the oldest techniques of getting out of your mind to use your head, uh, which has ever been known. The monastic cell, the monk in the desert, uh, the uh, yoga who uh, turns off the external world, and so forth. Uh, so the same phenomena which to an American psychologist causes psychosis, to most of the rest of the world is seen as one of the royal roads to uh, using your head. There's an amusing story about Gerald Hurd, uh, the 70 year old uh, British philosopher who's a tiny little man who went running around the country uh, several years ago looking for a psych psychiatric research center where he could jump in one of these sensory deprivation bats and take LSD and uh, use his head. Yeah. 
Now, so far, the notions of imprinting and psychedelic drugs uh, may be interesting, but uh, the implications are not uh, terribly dramatic. When I present this theory to psychiatrists, they would say, yes, that makes logical sense, but we could say the same thing in psychoanalytic terms, that uh, you work the chain of associations back to the original traumatic event or the original primal scene, and then uh, the, the task is, uh, of course, to understand that and do something about it. The way the analysts do it is they try to get back to the original imprint and then by having you fall in love with the analyst, uh, you try to build up another imprint. Uh, this is not, I'm not saying that critically. I think that the, the, the Freudian theory, the psychoanalytic theory of uh, free association to get back to the original event and uh, the transverse neurosis to get out of that or get a new imprint is one of the most brilliant uh, models ever developed by man. By man. And I'm, I'm really breathless in admiration. And the more I understand about imprinting, the shrewder and the more creative I see that Freud was. Uh, he was a brilliant man. Uh, but the thing which excites us these days is the corollary concept of psychedelic re-imprinting. Now, this is a, a very complicated and promising notion. Our concept of the brain at present is that uh, you and I have been presented at birth with this 13 billion cell camera uh, with the possibilities of shooting motion pictures all the time. But because of the genetic code and imprinting, we've been frozen with one snapshot. We think that the psychedelic drugs can suspend the old snapshot uh, and anyone who's had LSD will perhaps empathize with what I described someone's experience as your neurological camera tumbling uh, in a million different directions uh, any half hour, shooting all sorts of film that uh, you had never uh, thought possible before, and then very slowly over a period of 8 or 10 or 11, 12 hours, uh, uh, slowing down and eventually uh, coming to rest maybe after 16 hours. But we think that you come to rest with a new snapshot. Now, there's nothing that I'm saying about imprinting or LSD or re-imprinting which is either positive or negative. I'm not here to sell LSD <laughs> or to sell you on your brain. Uh, the more you think about the psychedelic experience in terms of neurological photography, you see that you can take beautiful pictures, or you can take miserable pictures. You can take frightening pictures. You can take holy pictures. You can take any kind of pictures. Uh, so that the challenge for psychedelic research at this point is to learn how to uh, use this incredible camera and uh, to uh, learn about lighting, what kind of objects you want to take pictures of, and so forth. Now, it's obvious, too, that uh, you don't lose your old imprint because after an LSD session you come back and you still speak English and you know how to lace your shoes. Um, as a matter of fact, that's one of the problems that uh, too often we go back too readily to the old orange basketball with all its uh, correlated habits. And one of the paradoxes that uh, intrigued us at the beginning of our research four and a half years ago was, why is it that for eight hours a person can be shooting up there in uh, all sorts of cosmic revelations, uh, uh, great Buddha enlightenments, and then the next day we're back in the same old neurological straitjacket? Well, I think uh, this is easily explained, that the original orange basketball that you and I imprinted, then uh, through conditioning, uh, built up around it hundreds of thousands or millions of associations, so that every, all our language, all of our rituals, all of our behaviors, and so forth, are connected with the original imprint. Whereas if uh, the man and his wife take LSD at sunset on their honeymoon, they take a wonderful new picture, but uh, uh, the problem and the challenge is 
that of course they don't stay uh, in that situation but tend to uh, drift back to the old habits because there are no new habits uh, or take a long time to build up habits around a new imprint. <coughs> Now, everything that we have learned and thought about re-imprinting in relationship to psychedelic drugs has led us to increase the cautions that we make about LSD. Uh, it's a very tricky proposition. And before, when we thought that a psychedelic session just lasted 12 hours and gave you a new view, but then brought you back, uh, uh, we... Um, uh, took chances in sessions that, uh, by hindsight now, we think are quite reckless because we think every time you have a psychedelic experience, there's a possibility of taking new pictures, which may be quite different from uh, your old pictures. And you should be very careful uh, with whom you take LSD and where you take LSD. And uh, you should be very well prepared because you're likely to come out of the session, of course, with uh, a purple colored football. <laughs> which may or may not cause problems when you go back to the office the next day, which is filled with orange basketballs. <laughs> now that the cautions have been presented, uh, I feel it's possible to say something about the uh, potentialities or the promises of this uh, theory. If someone gave you a very valuable camera, how often would you use it? Or when would you use it? This, of course, is the question how do you use your head? How often are you going to use your head? How often are you going to take LSD? We often use the concept of uh, serial re-imprinting, and that one concept of man's existence, which might well take hold in the future, is that uh, uh, you have this neurological camera, you obviously should use it any time you're changing your environment, any time you're taking a new job, any time you're moving into a new neighborhood, any time you're changing your interpersonal uh, network, any time uh, you have uh, a new uh, occupational task that uh, you, have, you, have, you want to have engraved and not connected to your basketball by a series of uh, associations, any time you have some important change in your life, you want to take a new snapshot. You don't want to take that old, tired uh, picture from the 10 or 15 years past and apply it in a new situation. Of course, there's a paradox here because the question, how often should you reprogram your nervous system? How often should you take LSD? Um, it's your present uh, robot snapshot identity which is deciding when it's going to change itself. And this accounts, I think, for the fear and the hesitation which almost all of us feel about a psychedelic drug session. Uh, I, I think that anyone who doesn't experience at some moment during their psychedelic session an intense, awe-full fear uh, has been cheated by their psychiatrist or their bootlegger. <laughs> One way of uh, deciding how often to take LSD in this utopian world of the future is uh, not to let your mind decide, because I'm suggesting that the genetic code wants our mind to be attached to externals and shuns the internal. Rather than letting your mind decide, why not let your body decide? And here's a fascinating aspect of uh, the pharmacology of LSD. You can't take LSD every day. That is, you can't keep your neurological camera just going uh, in this uh, kaleidoscopic uh, fashion uh, for more than 12 or 15 or 20 hours. This is what's called a refractory period. 
that if you take LSD today, you have to wait five, six, seven, or eight days before you can have uh, uh, another psychedelic effect. In other words, uh, if you suspend your snapshot, it takes maybe five or six days to uh, let the new snapshot kind of harden, and it's five or six, seven days before you're back in a new robot situation, and then um, uh, the nervous system is, is ready for uh, another reprogramming. So that um, it may well be in the utopian world of the future that uh, LSD and similar uh, foods and chemicals will be uh, used just as uh, vitamins are used today. Uh, and it's possible that uh, uh, every seven days you'll take LSD and bring your picture up to date. Now, uh, let me, the time is running out for the radio program, and I'm going to rush to the conclusions. There are other things which uh, can be taken up in the question period uh, that I wanted to talk about. Um, the conclusions that we've come to after four and a half years of psychedelic research is that we know almost nothing about our own heads or how to use them. And anyone who tells you he knows much about LSD, of course he's really talking about the potentialities of the brain, should be listened to with great caution. Because the human species at this time is a very primitive uh, species, which has just got this cortex only 40,000 years ago. And we're just now catching on to the possibility that we can use it and so uh, it's going to take several thousand years, I think, before we'll have any clue as to how really to use this incredible machine. But conclusion number one is... Thank you. Are you a pessimist or an optimist? Conclusion number one is that uh, the members of our research group have lost a lot of our zeal to uh, proselytize about the human brain or to uh, run large research projects or to get involved in any external politics uh, which would uh, attempt to uh, um, raise money for research grants or to get LSD accepted by the FDA and so forth. Your main job and my main job is to save your own head and to save, uh, to learn how to use your head and learn how to use my head, or to use the, uh, the uh, religious metaphor. The real task is to save your own soul and for me to save my own soul. Because the trap is always get caught in external programs, movements, publications, research grants, and so forth. The problem is always inside. And of course, this is the oldest message of uh, uh, that man has uh, ever told himself. There's a second uh, conclusion, and that is that there seems to be a duty to report back uh, for those who have been engaged in internal explorations. Uh, it's only fair, uh, since we're all in the dark anyway, to, uh, to share any landmarks or uh, any uh, um, points of interest uh, that uh, can be used for other travelers, and of course, that's what's been happening for centuries, and in our psychedelic research, we have relied on many maps uh, drawn by uh, men who made these voyages thousands of years ago. This book, The Psychedelic Experience, is based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is an eminently practical LSD guide, although it's uh, 2,500 years old. The third conclusion is that as you detach yourself from so complete an investment in external gains, you come to appreciate your own body more and uh, the, uh, the natural process more. <laughs> I should clarify that uh, we talk so much about the brain that once uh, someone listened to us said that the more we talked about the brain, 
Uh, she got the picture of, of my forehead getting higher and higher and my, my cranium swelling so that pretty soon it was this tiny little tendril of a body with this huge computer 13 billion cell camera on top. Um, this is quite the opposite of what we, we mean, that those who have uh, worked with psychedelic uh, drugs uh, know that you become more and more aware of the infinity of possibilities uh, within your own body and uh, less obsessively concerned with um, some externals which seem irrelevant. Another conclusion is, uh, I think as suggested by my early remarks, uh, uh, there is less and less interest in broad mass public activity and much more commitment to primary groups, uh, family groups, close uh, small groups of friends. Although the histories would have us lead, think that all the important events in man's uh, life are elections and wars and uh, this sort of thing, you know and I know that all the meaningful things in our life take place in private and with either one other person or a very small group of people. It's always been that way. It's always been that way and there's never going to be a large federally supported research grant on psychedelics which is going to learn to teach you how to use your head or help me solve my spiritual problems. Let's not kid ourselves. Uh, another conclusion is that, uh, and here um, I can't generalize, I'm talking about uh, the 30 or 40 people with whom I've been associated in this work, there's a much deeper appreciation for one of the oldest and most basic of human enterprises, and that is the male-female relationship. LSD is the most powerful aphrodisiac ever known to man. Now, it's interesting, some clapped and some did, and let me explain what an aphrodisiac is. Aphrodisiac comes from the Greek word for the goddess of love. Uh, an aphrodisiac is an agent which promotes love. And by aphrodisiac, I don't mean faster and more motions of robot bodies in uh, bedrooms. I'm, of course, talking about uh, the communication which can exist between people whose neurological cameras are accelerated and uh, much wider and more open. In the future, utopian society I've been talking about, uh, a wife may be a little bit worried if her husband has an illicit sexual affair, but real grounds for divorce will be if he takes LSD with another woman. <laughs> So here, the mystery comes full circle, because the paradox is that the more you use your head, the more in tune we think you get with the original purpose and design and goal of the genetic code, because uh, if there's anything the genetic code seems to want, it's to keep itself going. Uh, to keep the great game of life going. For your presence tonight and for your attention, I thank you. <laughs>